Good morning. Um, this morning's speaker is Dorothea Salo from University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, she's a faculty associate there in the I School. She's been there since 2007, and she's teaching technology, scholarly communication, organization of information, and anything else that needs teaching. So she's a woman of many talents. Uh, before that, she ran institutional repositories for University of Wisconsin and for George Mason University, so she's familiar with the area. And in her fun tan, she, she's a cyclist. She enjoys riding her bicycle, which is the color of my shirt, named Jacaranda. So we'll turn it over to Dorothea. Suddenly discovering that my speaker notes are not the way I wanted them. So give me just a moment. That's my presenter display. No idea. Oh, you know, I do know how that happened. That happened because what happens when you install a new version of Keynote? All right, here we go. So yeah, hi. <laughs> After that auspicious beginning, my name's Dorothea, and I do teach all of those things at the iSchool EW-Madison. After spending several years in academic libraries, working on open access and research data stewardship, when I was asked here to NASIG, the organizers, Anna, told me that I was slotted into a vision session, that I needed to offer a vision relevant to this excellent and distinguished conference. Something that's not happening on the ground right now that I think should be. So I pitched the organizers several ideas, which may not surprise you if you know me. Short of opinions is something I'm just not. Um, and, and the one that caught fire with them was the question of reader privacy with respect to electronic serials and ebooks, just, you know, e-resources generally. And that immediately brought to mind for me the unforgettable Billie Holiday, right? Seeing the 1920s Granger and Robbins Blues classic, whoa, and Kino quit unexpectedly. I'm having a good computer day, y'all. <laughs> Singing the, but keep going. Singing the 1920s Blues classic ain't nobody's business if I do. And, you know, the version of that song that Holiday sings, like many blues songs, it's got several versions. It starts out, there ain't nothing I can do, nor nothing I can say. The folks don't criticize me. But I'm going to do just as I want to anyway. I don't care if they all despise me. I love that. I love that. Because in my head, it completely captures what's going on right now with collection and exploitation of reader behavioral data. There's a whole lot of libraries and a whole lot of content providers in the big data or even small data game doing whatever they want, no matter what readers think. Might as well, right? Because whether you do or you don't, somebody's going to hate you. If you don't collect and exploit user data, your accountants are going to hate you, your big data nerds are going to hate you, because you're missing revenue opportunities or so they think. Not completely convinced here that the financial upside is what they think it is. Your usability people might also hate you. Because, yeah, they can learn useful things from snooping on users, dinking around with e-resources. I'm laying online here. That is snooping. Is what that is. I don't care how holy the reason is. But the uproar, if you tell them not to do it, um, seeing some of it right now, wow. There are usability wonks, and I'm all in favor of usability, who hate privacy wonks like me right now. Now, if you do collect and exploit user data in the way it's usually done today, tell you what, I hate you right back. Well, hate might be a little strong. But I'm definitely noping you. I am noping you, because if I, as a reader of serials, and I certainly do read serials, 
know that you're doing that, I trust you less. And I trust your systems less. And you know who else trusts you less? The American Library Association. See, ALA has this thing, this code of ethics thing, first got written in 1939, been revised a few times since then. Article three says, the libraries will protect each library user's right, right, to privacy and confidentiality. With respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. And transmitted, you can guess that was a later edition. Well, okay, so what? Right? So the ALA thinks reader privacy is important. So what? Mark Zuckerberg thinks we should all get over this privacy thing already. So who gives a flying flip about a nearly century-old ethics code from hysterical century-old librarians? Yes, I use the H word. Right, we're here in Washington, D.C., fully cognizant of the resonance of that word for librarians as Section 215 of the Patriot Act teeters on the sunset bubble. And I did that because it's a pretty salient and quite recent example of librarians taking the high road despite being called every name in the book. Not entirely dissimilar to what's happening to some library privacy advocates right now, to be quite brutally honest. And I could pound the podium about, at this point about abstractions like intellectual freedom, civil society, surveillance society, panopticons, blah, blah, blah. I could do that. But there are ethicists and philosophers and legal scholars and others who are all better at abstraction than I am. Rather keep it concrete. Plus the hotel would probably prefer that I didn't damage the podium. So concretely, we talked for a little bit about what's being called the Internet of Things. I mean, things, how much more concrete can you get? The basic idea here, for anyone not already familiar with it, is the gizmos that we own, gizmos, that have ticked right along for ages without internet connections can now be connected to the internet. Send information to it, get information from it. That lets us do things like operate them remotely, like a thermostat in my house that I can turn on over the internet from my office if I happen to be coming home early. They can also get information from the internet like a TV that automatically knows what's on. Network gizmos can give us insight into how they work and how to use them efficiently, again, like the thermostat. They can also give us insights into our own behaviors, like all the fitness trackers that are out there. And they can make suggestions that are at least nominally aimed at helping us. And yet, you know, one of the things that's happening right now with the Internet of Things is that the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is scrutinizing it pretty closely. This picture I have here is from the opening page of their January report on the Internet of Things. It's a good report. It's not too long. It's, you know, written in human language. I recommend reading it because it turns out it's super easy to cause people real tangible harm based on data coming from mundane items like a television or a fitness tracker or a thermostat. Thermostat? Seriously? So kind of the paradigm case. As it happens, I'm here, my spouse is home at the moment, right? But if that weren't so, imagine what somebody with access to my thermostat data is telling a home burglar. Oh, hey, house is empty, come get it. More subtly though, and this became a prominent public concern when Internet of Things thermostat maker Nest got bought by Google, what can this thermostat tell advertisers or even law enforcement about what goes on in my home that ain't nobody's business? Ain't nobody's business when my house has people in it and when it doesn't. It's one thing that starts to indicate whether there's a stay-at-home parent or somebody unemployed, somebody with a disability maybe, somebody who works at home. Right, starting to slot people into marketing categories here. You see where this gets a little squirrely? It starts to be information that can be used against me, especially when it's correlated with all the other data coming from every corner of my life. It could totally be used unfairly in credit and loan deliberations, 
rental decisions, things like that. We're already starting to see those horror stories coming out of the woodwork, data used for redlining, as well as extremely dubiously ethical marketing. Already been some documented publicized cases of stunning Internet of Things creepery, too, just stuff that is creepy. This Barbie doll, Hello Barbie, that records whatever a kid says to it and sends that to Mattel over the internet, where it piles up into a dossier on the kid. Kids, you know, totally no potential for abuse there, right? But okay, fine. Thermostats, Barbie, we're not reflecting what anybody's reading here. So it's not an intellectual freedom issue. So why is Internet of Things style creepy an issue for NASIG? Well, thanks to our friends at Adobe, I have an answer. We know e-resource use is being snooped on, collected into dossiers, just like what kids say to Hello Barbie. There is no possibility of doubt anymore. I don't think anybody here has been living under a rock, so we all know this, but just for a recap, Adobe is collecting reader behavior information from Adobe Digital Editions, um, including when that's used on library provided e-resources. Adobe got caught because they were stupidly transmitting this information in the clear. Good job, Adobe. Um, and they've stopped doing that, at least. But they've not stopped collecting the information. They've not stopped keeping it, as far as anybody knows. So I'm sorry, content providers, I really am, but there is no benefit of the doubt possible here. Readers cannot trust you. Librarians cannot trust you. Adobe shoved its foot in it right up to the thigh for all of you. We have to believe you're all behaving like Adobe until and unless you positively state and ideally prove otherwise. So what I'm ultimately saying here is that it actually makes a lot of sense to think of electronic resources as part of the Internet of Things. What is an e-book? What is an e-journal article? It's a mundane item, like a thermostat or a television, that you use for your own purposes, that back in the day wasn't Internet connected, there was no Internet, right? But now it is. It communicates with the internet and leaves data about you and about your behavior behind. Data that can be used to dish the dirt on you and to cause you real tangible harm, individually or just because your behavior happens to cluster with the behavior of others in a way that somebody with power doesn't approve of. The same privacy issues that the FTC cares about with Internet of Things gadgetry are entirely salient to electronic resources. So, hey, FTC, come over here and let's talk. Could we? I mean, we're right here in Washington, D.C. If privacy is going to be a thing for dolls and thermostats, it'd be really awesome if it was also a thing for ebooks and electronic journals. If that takes FTC intervention, rock on. I'm okay with that. because I could go into the horror stories here, the real ones and the what ifs, but I don't see a need. They're not all that different from what libraries have guarded against in the print era. Anyway, we've seen examples already, for heaven's sake. Aaron Swartz, Georgia State, High Oxford University Press, I know y'all are here. E-textbook and e-testing platforms collecting data about minors. You all know the score. It's because libraries were aware of all these risks, had experience with them back in 1939, that ALA took such a strong stance in favor of privacy and confidentiality. This is amazingly prescient stuff, even without the and or transmitted writer. Really respect ALA for this. So that's libraries' ethical stance on reader privacy. How about publishers? I mean, since a lot of you are here and all. Aggregators, 
some of you are here too, abstracting indexing services, I mean content providers generally. What is that industry's ethical stance on reader privacy? So I went looking for trade association reader privacy ethics statements. Because hey, I started in publishing, as a matter of fact. I didn't want to leave it out all of the people here at NASIC who are not librarians. And actually, I discovered something pretty interesting for slightly disturbing values of interesting. Started in the obvious place. Committee on Publication Ethics, right? Ethical issue, they gotta say something, right? Cope says nothing about reader privacy. Jack diddly squat. So Society for Scholarly Publishing, next likely suspect, they're right here with us. Hi, couldn't possibly ignore them. All right, hop across the pond, let's try the STM Association, Scientific Technical Medical Publishers Association. And of course the question of reader privacy is just as salient for open access journals as for anything else, right? If not more so. So I checked out OASPA too. And you know, I actually think it's pretty cool that to the best of my knowledge and belief, open access journals aren't really aggregating, collecting, selling user reader information and handing that over to publishers as a revenue stream, or to anyone, I should say, as a revenue stream, marketers more likely than publishers. And huh, maybe that's because of OASPA, maybe OASPA took a stand, I said to myself. All right, <laughs> coming to the end of my bag of tricks here. Um, maybe it's not OASPA, maybe it's DOAJ, right? Because they're coming up with quality criteria for inclusion and certification of open access journals these days. So maybe they've got a position on reader privacy. So as you know, a lot of you probably, I'm a long time open access advocate. I gotta say to my fellow open access folks, I am not cool with this. Can open access please take the high road here? So all right, I said to myself, I said, maybe looking at trade associations was the wrong way to go. Maybe that's not where this work is happening. Maybe it's at the individual publisher or journal level. That makes sense. Turns out that's been looked at. 2012 article published in College and Research Libraries. Um, open access, check it out. Pretty much crickets, folks. Pretty much crickets. There were privacy policies. Most journals do have them, but when you look at them, they're pretty terrible, basically. They do not measure up to library privacy standards. And unfortunately, we know that there are some pretty ugly issues here. Uh, both sides of the business model fence, nobody gets off scot-free, open access folks. Blogger, um, glue jar uh, CEO Eric Hellman checked 20 major research journal websites for evidence of ad network trackers. Who in case you haven't checked lately, you've been spreading malware as well as being generally creepy. Did he find trackers? Oh yeah, he found trackers. Lots and lots and lots of trackers. In both toll access and open access journal websites. And yeah, 20, that's a really tiny sample. So be my guest, expand it. You really think the results are gonna be more in favor of reader privacy? Because I do not. This is a technology infrastructure point and tech infrastructure is not really what I wanna talk about today. But just this one thing, librarians, the instant we put some third party resource on our website or in our lib guides or in our catalog or we refer our patrons to it some other way, we become responsible for its privacy implications. If it takes some kind of systematic ethics review of content provider websites to call out this kind of thing, 
maybe make some noise towards stopping it, I'm in favor. Let's do it. So in fairness to content providers, I am not saying there's a conspiracy theory here, okay? Um, no tinfoil hats, I don't, I really, not a conspiracy. Conspiracy is not a thing. It's historical accident, I think. Um, this absence of ethical responsibility statements from content providers, it happened because in the days of print, reader privacy was not really the content provider's problem. I mean, what could they do? The, the worst they could do is the fairly venial sin of selling subscriber lists, that's it. That's all you can do. There's no way to monitor the use of a print journal or a print index or a print anything. Either it got mailed to an individual subscriber and that subscriber did whatever they wanted to with it, doodle wildly all over the pages, make art installation for your favorite holiday, light it on fire, whatever, right? Or the publication gets sent to a library and maybe the library keeps track of how often that chunk of print leaves the shelf, um, but the library certainly doesn't know who picked it up, much less in what context. So it can't tell the content provider anything about that. Not that it would anyway, I hope. So content providers did not have to think about reader privacy. But times have changed, folks. Times have changed. The library isn't always in the middle of the publisher-reader transaction anymore. And even when we are, content providers have a lot more ways to compromise reader privacy available to them. So yeah, content providers in this room, y'all need to come up with an ethical position on reader privacy, please, okay? And there's actually an effort underway, some of you may have heard, to get a handle on this. NISO is working on this thing that they call a consensus framework to support patron privacy in digital library and information systems. And I am begging the NASIG community, each and every one of you sitting in this room, to watch this and to comment on it and to make all the participants in it very, very clear that we are watching. You are the right people. You are the people that NISO needs to hear from. Because I generally dig the word consensus, it's a good word, but I confess I'm a little worried that in the NISO context, it'll mean what it seems to mean in trade Pacific partnership negotiations, which is something like the rich content owners are gonna set the, ru the rules in a secret smoke-filled room and the rest of the world can just lump it. That is not consensus, that is railroading and it needs not to happen here. So I'm begging you, let's not let that happen. Until that or something like it does happen though, I gotta rely on the ALA Code of Ethics here, which actually doesn't bother me, I think it's a very good Code of Ethics. One of the things I want you to notice about Article 3 here, it's got zero qualifiers. None, do you see an asterisk or a dagger or a footnote here? I do not. Um, it doesn't say libraries protect privacy except when that's inconvenient. Because sure, it's super convenient to do usability testing or market research silently. It's super convenient for librarians who need tenure to trawl this kind of data. I get that, I do. And I'm not unilaterally against those things, I'm just unilaterally against doing them in the thoughtless and careless way that they're often being done now. Librarians, we get no smug points here. I am seeing articles in the library literature right now, today, that horrify me because they are so careless about reader data. Another non-footnote goes, libraries protect reader privacy expect, except when we're improving our services, which what even is that? That is one of the most amazing weasel phrases I have ever heard in my life. You can hide anything behind that, no matter how creepy. I mean, imagine that in the physical library, we're gonna follow you around the library and we're gonna record what you're reading with cameras and video and we'll keep that data indefinitely. But hey, don't worry. We're not gonna ask you your name. That's cool, right? And we're only following you around in order to improve our library services. 
In what world would that not be creepy? How is it any less creepy watching my e-resource reading trail? Just because it's immensely harder for me to figure out you're doing it, much less do anything about it, that's not less creepy, that's more creepy. We're talking sparkly vampire, zombie, werewolf, evil overlords, one ring levels of creepy here. I actually do think that the question, would we do this in the physical library, the physical bookstore, the NASIG exhibit floor, is a fairly decent heuristic rule of thumb for gauging something's creep factor. It's not perfect, absolutely not, but it's useful. Because our sense of what we will and won't do in physical spaces to physical people there with you physically is pretty strong, it's pretty sophisticated, and it's pretty well thought through. It also keeps our patron base, our reader base, from being divided into physical library users and digital library users and one group having better privacy protections than the other group, which that, that, that just ain't right. Throwing that out there for people to take home. Here's another one. Um, there is no asterisk in Article 3 saying that libraries protect privacy except when sharing data with partners, whoever partners are. Partners is another weasel word. Partners doesn't just mean content providers, so a lot of us, I think, need to be way more nervous about what we've got on our websites than we are. We saw that with Hellman's quick look at research journals and ad network trackers. Google Analytics, anybody? Facebook like button, yeah. We need to be a little nervous about that. Because Google, our good buddy Google, also stuck its foot in it right up to the thigh on privacy. If you're not in K-12 circles, you may have missed this one. So the story is that schools, um, K-12 schools, using Google Apps for Education, which is free, suddenly found out that Google was assembling data and profiling their students based on the email that students exchanged, and they were using those profiles for advertising. Despite many public protestations that, of course, apps for education respects privacy. What, what, what can I even say about that? Except that I don't trust Google with behavior data as far as I could throw Google. I don't think any of us should. I know Google Analytics Terms of Service says that Google respects privacy. I don't believe what Google says about that. Why should I? Why should you? Why should anybody? Speaking of education, Article 3 has no exception for learning analytics either, whatever those are when they're not being creepy. The librarians generally don't rat out students to their instructors, even when the students are being stunningly unwise, which they, you know, it happens. Because they're learning, right? We know we have to leave them a private space for the various kinds and levels of, I'm being vague here, unwisdom that happen during the learning process. Digital doesn't change that. It's not any more okay to rat students out, because we have a lot more detailed ways to do it now. Um, I'll tell a story on myself, actually, about that one. Our course management system at UW-Madison, like many, tracks what students do on their individual course websites and how long they spend doing it. So for one online course I was teaching, I noticed that students weren't spending hardly any time on the main lesson pages where the video content was, and they weren't clicking on the links I put in to their various readings. So I'm like, seriously, people? I got really upset about that. I pitched a fit, um, only to find out that students were downloading the video rather than streaming it because the streaming wasn't working. Yeah, you could have told me, but you know. And they were clicking on links from the PDF syllabus 
instead of from the course pages. They were doing the work. They were. They just weren't doing the work in the way that the course management system was able to capture and track. And my poor students, they were sincerely hurt and they were scared and they had every right to be. Um, I'm, I am sorry about this to this day. Any of you are in the audience here, I'm sorry. Um, and since then, I've been super skeptical of what learning analytics can tell us, is it even useful, and super aware that they break trust bonds between student and instructor that I need, that I rely on to do effective work in the classroom. So I've learned my lesson. I don't want to surveil my students. Don't want anybody else surveilling them either. That absolutely includes the library. It absolutely includes e-resource content providers. But at this point, it doesn't even look like I can say no. How do I say no, people? How do I tell all y'all, leave my students alone? Speaking of Georgia State, Oxford, I want publishers out, out, out of course management systems, out. Y'all creepy, stay out. And finally, there is not an exception to library protection of privacy based on whether the patron knows or cares what's going on. Libraries pretty much assume that patrons usually don't know or care, safe assumption, right? You read Pew Internet, I'm sure. But that's not enough to let us do whatever we want. Not ever, we are not Facebook. We also know, for example, that some privacy violators go to great lengths to keep people from knowing that their privacy is being systematically trashed, Patriot Act. We also know that some of our patrons absolutely, vitally need their privacy respected to be safe and to feel safe in our spaces, virtual as well as physical even if some of our patrons don't actually have to care about privacy, yay them, um, others do, based on their research interests, based on their particular life circumstances, whatever. And I gotta say here, I went looking before I gave this talk, don't think it's coincidence that practically all the librarians and other pundits I've seen saying that libraries go too far protecting privacy have been white men. Not a coincidence. Check yourself before you wreck yourself like Google Buzz and Google Plus, folks. If libraries don't respect privacy, patrons who desperately need privacy will not trust libraries. Sometimes these are the very patrons who need us most. So libraries default to privacy, we have since 1939, and I believe with all my heart and soul that that is the correct default. Now, slight loophole, Article 3 doesn't say when the patron has knowingly consented, which yeah, I agree, that's a whole different ballgame. What I'm seeing, again, particularly from white men, is some kind of sense that the library can do whatever it wants with patron web behavior, reading behavior data, because supposedly patrons don't care. I don't know where they're, they're getting that sense, I don't know where that's coming from, but it sure ain't the ALA Code of Ethics. Oh, and nobody cares, you say, I care. Y'all don't get, just get to say patrons don't care, readers don't care, I am a library patron, as well as a librarian, as well as a library school instructor. I am a reader of electronic content, e-books, e-journals. I care a whole lot about my personal privacy. Your whiz-bang technology rig, whatever it is, ReadCube, doesn't account for me doesn't account for other people with the smarts and the grit to believe in privacy, to want privacy. There's something pretty seriously wrong with your technology rig. And you might want to check your ethics, too. And this is where I get back to the song. The song made famous by Bessie Smith and by Lady Day, because if you listen to it, I honestly didn't remember this until I'd already chosen the talk title. 
If you listen to the song, Ain't Nobody's Business, If I Do, you find out that it's about the singer allowing other people to walk all over her, to hurt her and to exploit her. And I'm being a little vague here because the song is really painful and really hard hitting. So I'm warning people, only look at the lyrics if you're okay with that. Um, and the song insists that it's her right to let those awful things happen and nobody should interfere with that. And the way Lady Day sings this song, it's really clear to me that for her, the song comes from this place of deep despair, deep helplessness. Don't interfere with my self-destruction, she sings. Because if I can't even do myself any good here, what good do you think you can do me? It's an amazing song. I'm guessing that feeling is familiar to some folks here with respect to privacy generally, reader privacy particularly, it's easy to feel helpless faced with these incessant onslaughts on privacy. It's super easy for any information seeker to throw their privacy down the drain. Super easy for any library to enable that. Super easy for any web service that libraries use, any web service that uses library interfaces to enable that. Super easy for any content provider to enable that, and yeah, patrons do sometimes tell us, screw privacy, I want what I want. What I'm saying here is just because it's easy and convenient to screw privacy doesn't make it right. It doesn't mean we have to lie down and take it, especially in Internet of Things big data scale. So I'm supposed to give you a vision in this talk and I haven't done that yet, so here it is. Here's my vision. Super simple, really. I want libraries and content providers to live up to Article 3 of the ALA Code of Ethics, to protect each library user's right, and here I'll say reader, each reader's right, to include those of us in the room who are content providers rather than librarians. Each reader's right to privacy and confidentiality, with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. No exceptions. And yes, I know that is a radical position right now. Ain't the first radical position I've espoused in my career. Hope it ain't the last. This is my vision. I am sticking to it. No exceptions. Because seriously, it ain't nobody's business. It ain't the webmistress's business. It ain't my wonderful departmental librarian's business. It ain't no publishers or aggregators or a &I providers' business. It ain't the NSA's business. It ain't your business. It ain't nobody's business if I do read serials. So what we do, besides providing input to the NISO process I mentioned earlier, which I hope all y'all will do, what can we do to bring this vision closer to reality? Wish I knew. Wish the bottom of my heart I had a pat answer for you here today. This is complicated, right? Just scratch the surface. But I think I know where to start. Practically my classroom go-to for all kinds of situations. First we understand the risks as best we can and then we mitigate them. Certainly acknowledging that there are some things like organizations obsessed enough to dive to the bottom of the ocean in order to copy internet traffic off fiber optic cable. This was apparently a thing. Uh, we just, we don't control that. How is this the world I live in? I don't even know. So the first question I think we gotta get a handle on is exactly what it kind of information about readers causes risks to them. And for convenience, I'm dividing that into three buckets of information. PII, you know, classic one, what I call long tail information and behavior trail information. And I mean, I think we're all aware of the dangers of personally identifying information. It's really scary. I don't need to elaborate on that. All I want to say is that it's not the only category of data that we need to be concerned about. And that sometimes privacy policies use PII as kind of a smoke screen for abuse of other classes of data. 
They proclaim very loudly that PII is either not collected or very carefully protected, and they don't say anything about anything else. Not okay. Any ethical framework that we build around data needs to consider more than just PII. Next class of information is what I'm calling long tail information, by which I mean data collected about patrons. It's a serious outlier in privacy problematic ways. There's data about people, for example, that isn't strictly speaking PII, but is still uncommon enough to identify specific individuals. This happened in the AOL search log release fiasco, happened with the Netflix prize fiasco, the Hauser Facebook case. It's how browser fingerprinting works. It's actually pretty common. And classic anonymization techniques don't fix it. And we're all outliers in one way or another. So even if somebody doesn't stick out in one data set, combine a bunch of data sets that contain information about them, and this is exactly what data brokers and web trackers and ad networks do, and more and more people become individually identifiable, PII or no PII. What people read? Totally long tail information is trackable back to us, for some of us even more than others. Y'all could get your hands on journal reading data from Utah Madison. You could correlate my reading with my public pinboard bookmarks, where I keep all the stuff I save for my classes. 2.5 seconds, you would know it was me. Guarantee you I read stuff that nobody else on my campus does. Anything in my journal readings that's unexpected, an outlier, you'd know I read it. And you'd be able to start guessing why. And just another paradigm example, four years ago, when my mother was dying of cancer of unknown primary origin, my outlier journal reading would have been extremely sensitive information. Get me? That leads me to behavior trails. One reading transaction, one visit to a website, probably not super re-identifiable, unless what you're reading is seriously an outlier. Where it starts being problematic is where you track a whole bunch of reads, a whole bunch of visits from the same person, even when you've supposedly de-identified that person. Or even when you just keep highly specific timestamps along with the interaction, that's often enough to reconstruct a behavior trail. And the more behavior trail data you have and the longer you keep it, the worse the privacy problem gets. The more likely it is, the easier it is to correlate interactions, the more likely it is you capture outlier reads that patrons don't really want you associating with them. And you know, one great way libraries deal with this problem is that we track the stuff instead of tracking the people. We don't try to chain together, even correlate uses. We can't. Going back to the physical library, you see a bunch of stuff on the cart, you scan the barcodes, and it goes into a database this got used. And who knows who used it? And correlating use is dubious at best because you don't know who left the stuff on the cart, how many people left stuff on the cart. So you don't make that assumption. As data collection practices go, this is pretty respectful of reader privacy. We also, speaking digitally, watch out for proxy server logs because those are full of behavior trail information. Do we have to keep them? Yes. So we gotta watch out for people who are like downloading all of Factiva or something. Um, we don't usually keep them very long because we understand there's a privacy issue there. More of that. Let's throw data away with wild abandon. Um, data's a hot potato, drop it. Records manager wisdom, y'all. This is records manager wisdom. Listen to your records managers, they get it. The next question we need to get a grip on is who wants to know? And a lot of times people answer this question by occupation. You know, you got your spooks, you got your marketers, you got your academic researchers, you got your usability wonks, black hat hackers, stuff like that. I'm actually gonna carve it up a different way by how and why people approach data about other people and the techniques that they're likely to use to get hold of it and analyze it, because I actually think that gets at the risks better. So this is only a first approximation, don't hold me to it. But I think there are data omnivores, data opportunists, and data paparazzi. The NSA is an omnivore, right? Google, Facebook, Amazon, commercial data brokers, they are omnivores. Black hat hackers are typically omnivores. They want, if there's data, they want it. Give it here. 
Um, and they definitely want to trawl through it and match data to people. The only way to prevent that is to keep data out of their greedy little paws. Even when they are actively lying to you and trying to subvert any effort you make to kick them out of your systems. It's hard. How to do it is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but most of the fixes I know of are partial at best, mostly technical. Opportunists are trying to do cool and useful things with data. They're academic researchers, and they're data collectors trying to be nice to academic researchers. That's what the whole AOL search logs fiasco was about. They're web and social media developers. They're usability wonks. They're hackathoners. They're open data advocates, assessment experts. They're what Ann Arbor District Library used to call super patrons. They're people with their hearts in the right place, but that doesn't mean they've thought things through. Data opportunists have made a lot of big privacy messes. This is actually also where I'd place patrons who want to reuse their own data, right? Or who want access to a family member's data for at least nominally reasonable reasons, things like that. Nothing wrong with what they want to do, necessarily. They just don't understand the broader implications. If we kept this data on everybody, there would be a problem. Or they're lucky enough that they don't have to care. I am not that lucky. The thing about data opportunists is they don't want to hurt anybody. That's not what they're in business to do. They don't want the backlash that happens if they screw up privacy. Even if they don't know they don't want it, they don't want it. We can help teach them um, how not to screw up, why not to screw up. And they're often good allies once they understand the issues. So data paparazzi, what's different about them is that they have a target, a specific person that they're after, and they're going to pursue that target through whatever data they can find. They are people on political crusades, speaking of Washington, D.C. They're doxers, they're kidnappers, they're perpetrators of violence, they are other people who hate and who harm. And pop, data paparazzi are terrifying because they are obsessed, they are immoral, and they will stop at nothing. They will social engineer you, they will hack your systems and try to use them against their target, they will take over a target's account to impersonate them or ruin them. They will correlate whatever they find out from you about their target with anything else they can find, so don't be thinking, well, they don't want the data we have. Of course they do. Some people, even some security researchers, will tell you, don't worry, be happy, about behavior trail data, other non-PII, because re-identification attacks, they say, don't have a real high success rate. Ed Felton, security researcher, and his research crew argue, and I agree with them, that this notion is based on the idea that the only people after the data are omnivores and opportunists, not paparazzi. The thing about attacks by paparazzi, because they're so tightly targeted and so relentless, there's a much higher chance of being successful than of doing somebody harm. So please worry about this. Worry about the patrons you have, the readers you have, who have got paparazzi on their trail. Guarantee you have at least one such patron or reader. Probably lots more. Last question is a big one, right? What do we do? What do we not do? No ostriching. Heads out of the sand, please. And to that end, I want you to know about the Library Freedom Project, if you don't already. It's Knight Foundation funded. It's run by the amazingly badass Allison Macrina. All about libraries protecting reader privacy and all the ways we can find to do that. Libraryfreedomproject.org. On that same theme, um, profession level, industry level, advocacy and policy work, super important here. And only in its infancy, really, I'm, I'm grateful to NISO for picking up this ball and running with it. Without those, librarians don't know what to do, what to negotiate for, what to hope for. And content providers get stuck in this nasty prisoner's dilemma cat fight, right? Because anybody who takes the high road on privacy has to be afraid they'll be outcompeted by somebody else on the road to hell. Trade associations, this is kind of your job, all right? I, I, no more crickets. I don't want to hear crickets anymore. 
on this. And the next thing is don't give up. Forget about the song, please. Amazing song, though it is. We're not helpless. We can take concrete action to protect reader privacy, and it's absolutely worth doing. Let's use our Benjamins wisely, librarians. License negotiation time is the time we can ask the hard questions. We can nail content providers down to some concrete answers. And I know World Plus Dog is trying to use license negotiations for policy issues. Um, I'm asking you to consider doing it one more time. Because I said earlier, once we add something to our website or our catalog, once we're pointing patrons at it, we are responsible if it compromises their privacy. Content providers, give us privacy policies we can feel good about, please. I can't make it any simpler than that. I know assessment is a thing, assessment not going away. Uh, can we please assess mindfully? Can we please be conscious of data leakage, data abuse scenarios? In too many libraries, too many content providers, assessment is so compelling, and it is compelling, I get that, that it's obliterating privacy uh, considerations, and that's not okay. It's actually kind of scaring me. You know, with my other hat on, I teach research data stewardship, have to talk about IRBs. IRBs exist because scientists decided that their work was too important to bother about whether they were hurting people or lying to them about what was going to happen to them. Seriously, is that the scenario we're going to revisit here? I really hope not. When we see this, we got to call it out. We got to refuse to participate. We got to refuse to publish this kind of work. Actually, I, I'm on the editorial board for the Journal of Librarianship and Scholarly Communication, and we had an issue with this once. Uh, we got to insist on confronting the privacy issues openly and conscientiously. One final thought that you can take home with you. Not even the greediest data omnivore, the most clueless data opportunist, or the most evil of data paparazzi can misuse data that isn't there. Right now, collectively, our reader data default is collect it, unless you give me a reason not to. And that's completely backwards, all right? The correct default is don't collect reader data unless there's a clear and well-justified reason that we need to. Just don't. The shoe needs to be on the foot of reasonable and transparent, not just transparent to us, but transparent to our readers, justification for any data that we collect and use. Because that's another useful decision heuristic, right? If you dread explaining your data collection and your data use to your readers, if you start weasel wording all over it because you're afraid of the backlash, Maybe, just maybe, whatever you're doing does not pass the sniff test. Article 3, ALA Code of Ethics. That's my vision of where we need to be. I'm asking all of you, please help me make this vision real. Because one more time, and please say it with me, it ain't nobody's business if I do read serials. Thank you very much. Look forward to the rest of the conference. And wow, I clocked this at an hour and it is 9.59. I am good. Um, I think we have a little time for questions. The backstory there is I used to hopelessly overwrite talks and find myself rushing toward the end. Oh, wow. Lots of time for questions. Awesome. Um, if you have any questions, I can bring the microphone to you. All right. Hi, I'm Angela Dersel House at the University of Montana. Hi, Angela. Uh, 
Uh, what's your take on the emerging field of uh, user experience librarianship? Um, from my understanding, after hearing your talk, mm -hmm. a lot of the activities that would be required of that position you could describe as creepy. So what is your advice uh, to librarians that may be tasked with these uh, activities in the future? Okay, there's, and I wanted to put this in the talk, I found that I didn't have time. UX, U, the field of UX in my experience is actually incredibly careful about this in large part because they have so much empathy with the people that they're trying to study. So many, many UX um, experiments are, um, you get participants, you invite them to participate and you tell them as much as you can without fouling the study about what you're gonna do.